Um, okay, um, so my name is Olga Simek, uh, and the title of my presentation is a Beef Supervision Approach for Arabic Name Identity Recognition. This is a joint work with my collaborator, Courtland Van Dam. We are both from um, Lincoln Laboratory, which is a federally funded um, research lab that's uh, managed by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And so this is just a brief outline of my talk. Um, I'm going to uh, name entity recognition. Um, then I will describe the weak supervision approach. Um, and uh, then I will uh, go into details on our proposed approach, uh, evaluation results, and conclude with future work. So uh, extracting named entities is um, it's basically a, a, a core of uh, many information uh, systems. Uh, it's um, an important task because uh, lots of factual information and knowledge is kind of in, encoded in, in those names. So, you know, when you ask questions about when, whom, where, and so on, name entities play an important role. Um, and so extracting them is, uh, you know, natural language processing is, it's, you know, a very important step, uh, you know, for downstream tasks like on, um, you know, knowledge graph, uh, for example, and, and a bunch of other things. So uh, when we talk about name entity recognition, you know, what we mean here is, you know, we, you know, we have a text, um, you know, with a sequence of tokens, we want to, uh, find um, the names, uh, classify them into the corresponding um, entity classes, and um, also very often assign some sort of a unique identifier from a database. So I have just a quick example below. I have a sentence, uh, Stephen Paul Jobs, co-founder of Apple Inc. was born in California. And so Stephen Paul Jobs uh, would get highlighted, would be classified as a person. Um, and Apple Inc. Uh, would be classified as an organization. California would be location. So I have, uh, you know, three different entity types in this sentence, person, organization, and location. And those are very often the most, uh, you know, common entities that, that you see in these uh, named entity extraction systems. So um, those three are, you know, very, very common uh, types. That's most of the NER research is done on, but there is all kinds of, uh, you know, other classes that you might be interested in and customize your models to, to extract. So uh, uh, measures, for example, are important, you know, dates, times, uh, all kinds of uh, publication titles, movie titles. There's a whole slew of classes of entities in, uh, you know, biology and medicine related fields like uh, disease, drug names, and so on. And there's a couple of reasons, at least, why uh, named entity extraction is difficult. Uh, there's a lot of uh, language ambiguity, and this is true across different languages, um, not just true for English. Um, uh, a named entity can, you know, be often the same as, you know, a bunch of other common words. For example, may can be a month, a verb, a surname. Um, and there's also uh, an ambiguity between uh, the name entity and, and the type that it can be. So Washington can be a location or a person, for example. So, um, so these ambiguities make this um, this task um, a difficult one. Um, for uh, conversational named entity um, extraction, there are additional um, you know challenges. The syntax in conversation, you know, the syntax is different. Uh, the, you know, conversations are much more informal. Um, so uh, you could have spelling errors and all kinds of stuff, um, you know, compared to like news data and, and so on. Um, so what we do here is we focus on Twitter as a proxy for, uh, for other types of, of chat data. And with tweets, you know, they're usually short. They contain uh, uh, terse language, shorthand. Uh, misspellings, they're informal, um, they have no standard language. Uh, so a lot of the usual um, natural language processing tools really uh, don't, don't work um, and need to be modified. Um, for Arabic entity extraction, there is additional set of challenges, of course. Um, so in terms of uh, named uh, uh, Entity recognition research, uh, Arab actually is a pretty low research language, especially in terms of conversational Arabic. So annotated um, data sets are limited. Um, most of the focus has been done on classical and modern st standard Arabic uh, named entity recognition, uh, but uh, the work on social uh, media or conversational Arabic is, is limited. Um, another thing that, that 
poses actually significant challenges. There is no name capitalization in Arabic. So, you know, some of the syntactic features are, are missing. And uh, for example, capitalization is, uh, you know, quite effective and helpful when it comes to name and entity recognition. Um, it's uh, also, Arabic is also very varied language. There is three uh, main classes, classical, modern, standard, and colloquial. Um, so classical Arabic, for example, is used for like religious texts. Um, modern standard Arabic, it's like the, the formal Arabic taught in schools and used in media and so on. And uh, colloquial Arabic um, is a spoken form of Arabic and it differs. There's lots of dialects, it differs from region to region. Um, so this difference between dialects can be significant. Um, the majority of social media stuff is in colloquial Arabic. Um, and the, these different forms of Arabic uh, vary enough so that you have, um, you know, a domain shift problem on um, when you try to use tools built on one, uh, when you use them on, on another type of um, Arabic, then those tools a lot of times perform poorly. Um, so uh, here I have some some background on the name recognition, uh, name entity recognition for for Arabic. Um, there's basically the approaches fall into two broad categories. So there's the rule based approaches where you have, um, you know, analysts use gazetteers and write rules, uh, you know, in form of regular expressions to identify entities in the text. Uh, and then there's the learn based approaches, which use machine learning on to extract named entities. And then for the machine learning NER algorithms, uh, those tend to fall into two groups as well. So there's the classical machine learning, like support vector machines, decision trees, and, and so on. Um, and then there's the, the deep neural network, deep learning approaches. And the current state of the art uh, approaches prob uh, primarily use uh, these deep learning models. And the, the main models that come up in this work are uh, the BioLSTM, so bidirectional long short term memory models, um, conditional random fields, which are graphical models, uh, and then transformers, which use attention and are used on, uh, you know, I, I, you know, there's been lots of progress in this field, so things come, new things come up all the time. But traditionally, they're based on Google's uh, bidirectional encoder representation uh, or the BERT model. Um, and there's lots of variations of, of BERT models, um, ARABERT, uh, multi, uh, multi bert for multiple languages, and and so on. Um, so those are some of the like important model types. And on um, the weak, so let me move on to uh, to talk about the, the weak supervision um, approach for natural language processing. So um, the method uh, basically automatically labels a targeted text uh, and you don't have to have any training data whatsoever. So that's, that's a big deal because training data for natural language processing tasks, you know, uh, if you have to ma annotate it ma manually can be, uh, very time consuming, expensive, and so on. So, uh, so yes, uh, and and deep learning models require, uh, you know, big label data sets to, to train. So that's that's always an issue, not just, you know, natural language processing, but in a lot of machine learning uh, work. Um, so uh, the weak supervision approach basically has two steps. You uh, you use these so-called labeling functions to label your text and labeling functions also referred to as weak learners a lot of times they can be you know rule based uh, they can be other algorithms trained on on different data um they can very much vary in in quality you know and accuracy so um so you collect um a bunch of these labeling functions and then what you do is you um aggregate uh these functions to obtain your uh, labeled set, uh, and you do that with some statistical model. So um, this basically, uh, you know, more or less summarizes what I just says. Said so we um, we combine these noisy labels, right? We can have mistakes that our labeling functions make. Uh, you know, they can have poor coverage, you know, poor accuracy, miss lots of things. So, um, but. Um, you know, rather than labeling data by text, we just um, have a bunch of these function uh, functions. Um, they um, are usually scored and weighted by the roughly estimated performance. And then you have this machine learning, um, you know, there's different algorithms that you can use that, that combine those to, to get your final labels. And those labels can be um, probabilistic. They don't have to be deterministic. 
So uh, snorkel is a uh, very popular uh, week uh, supervision framework. Um, it's reasonably easy to use. Uh, and one nice thing about it is that it has, it has very easily encodable uh, labeling functions. So, um, so you can just, uh, you know, create a bunch of them and it's, it's pretty easy to do. Um, and then it uses a generative model to, to aggregate the, the labels. The problem for us uh, with just using Snorkel, even though it has been used for, for NER uh, with varying uh, degrees of success, the problem for us is that it's um, it's actually designed for classification and not for uh, sequence labeling. So um, so as I'll show you later for, for our task, in, in Arabic it actually didn't do very well. Um, so what we did is we took approach uh, of listen at all, and uh, that uses uh, hidden Markov models, and we adapted it to, to this um, Arabic NER problem. So uh, here, again, you know, it's a weak supervision approach. So you take your labeling functions, right, uh, which could be models, you know, gazetteers, which are lists of entities, uh, you know, heuristic functions, rules, and so on. And, uh, you know, you run your unlabeled data through, uh, through all these labeling functions, and you obtain uh, basically sequence labeling, right? Where each token, uh, you uh, you get annotation, whether it's an entity or not, and what type of entity it is. So uh, then you can allow probabilistic labels. So you can have a token be part of a person entity with some probability and part of location entity with some other probability. And so you feed all of this into this uh, in Markov model on um, aggregation. Uh, uh, pipeline. So the states on uh, in in this model are on um, corresponding to the actual true labels, which we don't know, right? Those are latent. Um, you can have multiple emissions, you know, one per labeling functions. Basically, um, you assume to be mutually independent, conditional on on the latent underlying label, but you don't know. Um, so observations are the annotations from each labeling functions, and you use this, uh, uh, it's called a uh, Baum-Welsh um, algorithm, which is actually a, a variant of uh, expectation maximization algorithm uh, to estimate the um, this uh, HML model through um, unsupervised training. So um, once you're done with that, you get this output when you have uh, aggregated labels. So each of your tokens, you know, it is labeled, but it can have probabilistic labels. And then afterwards, you can take this as your, um, you know, as your output. And actually, uh, that oftentimes works pretty well. But then uh, sometimes you can improve your accuracy by actually training a sequence labeling model. And the package that uh, Listen and all have uh, posted on GitHub. Uh, has uh, uses BioLSTM to to train a deep learning model. It has a conditional random field uh, optional layer, and then it has like some uh, embeddings you can pick. So you can use word embeddings or character embeddings, I believe, are in their package. So um, now I just want to uh, to say a few words on on the types of labeling functions that we used. And uh, there is basically just two types for this that, that we work with. So um, there's the out of domain NER models. Uh, so those are on, you know, usually deep learning models, they don't have to be, and they're trained on large corpora that um, are out of domain, right? They're not, uh, you know, they're usually trained on like newspaper articles or, or, or Wikipedia, most of them. Um, and then there is the gazetteers and dictionaries of entities. And those are basically, like I mentioned, uh, well, just lookup tables of uh, names of people, names of countries, you know, geographic lists, um, you know, lists of organizations, companies, and stuff like that. Um, and so in particular, we incorporate five uh, weak learners or these uh, NER models into our pipeline. So the first one is Parasa. Uh, uh, it's a pretty uh, well-known um, Arabic language uh, named entity recognition model. So it combines uh, conditional random fields, on uh, it's which uh, are trained on the the inner corp, which is also a popular uh, annotated corpus. It's uh, it's an Arabic corpus of news data. Uh, 
And uh, Perhaps also uses these cross-lingual features where you do, uh, you know, if the phrase translates into English into a name, then, then you label it. So, um, so that's that one. Um, then Hatmimoha is another one. Uh, so that's uh, the, basically a, a fine-tuned uh, BERT model. Um, they fine-tuned in on 14,000 sentences collected from the internet. It recognizes uh, more entity types that, than we're interested in. So uh, it has nine entity types, includes events and disease and some other stuff. Uh, so we only uh, consider performance on, on the three standard types, the person, organization, and, and location. And um, okay, next one is uh, it's called M now more M now more. <laughs> so that one's a simple model. That's just a linear um, SVM uh, trained on on the NRCorp data set. And Arabert is is actually quite a powerful um, model. Um, so it's uh, it's a BERT model trained on on the Arabic News Corpus. Um, and then we also have uh, multibird in there, and that's um, you know model that's the same as Arabic, but it's trained on on actually a Wikipedia articles of the top hundred languages um, that have the largest Wikipedias. Um, and so yeah, so those are the five uh, NER models in our pipeline, uh, and then I have the the gazetteers. We use a bunch of those. So uh, Wikifain is one, and that one's a uh, uh, Arabic named entity recognition gazetteer compiled from Wikipedia. It contains almost seventy thousand entities from fifty different classes. Um, so these are yeah, these are all available online. Uh, NetLexicon is the next one. So that one's actually automatically constructed, and it's a um, bilingual lexicon of named entities, and paired with paired with the transliteration and translation. Um, and it uses the Wikipedia and Newswire. Um, then Arabic uh, named entities is the next one. Um, so yeah, it's a named entity resource for Arabic, totaling on um, about 45,000 uh, named entities. Those are extracted from Wikipedia. And, um, you know, they also have like an English translation and some other information. Uh, JRC names um, is a large multilingual list of names and their spelling variants. Uh, and it's collected from um, hundreds of thousands of news reports by the, you know, daily, uh, by the uh, Europe Media Monitor. Uh, GeoNames has, a, it's basically a geography database of locations, includes countries, cities, and so on. Uh, and we, you know, just subselect uh, the Arabic translation and translations of locations from this. Uh, and I think the last one, I believe, is the Nile AP Gazette. Um, and that's actually a Arabic person's uh, names gazetteer. So it has 90,000 full names collected from public resources, but it also has a list of just like uh, first male and female names, and then just a separate list of family names. So uh, let's let me move on uh, next to the evaluation. And the first um, Thing here is the you know the data sets that we used. So we used um, two data sets for training. We just used uh, the Calc 2018 data set from the Calc 2018 task. Uh, so these are uh, tweets from either um, uh, modern standard Arabic tweets or um, Egyptian Arabic tweets um, produced by political figures. Um, and we split this training set from uh, into training and validation sets. So our training set contains about 10,000 tweets. And so we don't, right, so this approach doesn't need labeled data at all. So we remove um, the gold labels, the news and model um, for the training. So for test data, uh, there's uh, not a very large, but um, like I said, the, the resources for Arabic uh, you know, Twitter data are not, um, you know, very plentiful. So uh, there's a Dervish data set that contains about 1,400 tweets and 26,000 tokens. And those are um, Arabic language tweets um, scraped in a certain time period. And uh, we also use the development set from CALC 2018 on our, as our test set. So two different sets. Um, the 
labels. The reason we, we took the development set instead of a test set that's also published is that the labels are not publicly available on a test set and we want to be able to calculate the performance, right? So, and that set contains about 1,100 um, tweets. For, uh, for our metrics and baselines, um, so like I said, we uh, evaluate on the most common entities, person, organization, and location um, due to their prevalence across the data sets. Those are the most um, popular entities that everybody seems to evaluate on. And we use the standard metrics of precision recall and F1 score for each of these three entity types. And um, our baselines consist of uh, the snorkel model that I've talked to you about um, a little bit before. So that's the weak learning pro, uh, platform, uh, which statistically combines the prediction of labeling functions with varying degrees of accuracy to, uh, to label this unlabeled data. Um, and uh, the other one, the other baseline is the majority vote. So that just predicts the label uh, with the highest frequency. And we do have to set some threshold there because most of the, um, you know, most of the tokens are labeled non-entities. So um, so we want to take some threshold where at least a certain number of, of these labeling functions actually do label the, um, the token as, as an entity to, to use this majority vote. And for the state of the art, uh, you know, to compare our performance to, we picked uh, Helva et al. Um, work. And it's those are actually not... Um, weak uh, supervision approaches there because the you know we uh, th this is sort of the the novelty of you know our work is we we are the first ones to, to our knowledge to actually use this approach on on our on um, at least for the uh for the social media data um so the health approach is semi-supervised uh or uh fully supervised he introduced a, a bunch of approaches in in his paper and there is um there's similar performance between them. So uh, the the models are trained on Anarcorp on and Wikipedia data sets. And uh, the thing is, is that they on um, you know they don't use uh, you know they they're trained on out of domain data. So it's uh, so it's a reasonable comparison in terms of performance uh, for us to use. And uh, in our result tables, we include. Um, performance for each of the weak learners. So each of the NER models, as well as our baselines and, and the state of the art approach by health. Um, another note that uh, I want to, to mention here is uh, for us actually had a super high performance on just a Darvish data set. And so they must have included it in their training on this is what we hypothesize, you know, in, in the for us the version that we used because the, the performance there is just, yeah, very, very, very high. Um, so, uh, and way higher than anything else. So we actually retrain our model without Farasa before we run it on, on the Darvish data set. Um, and for the, for the Helvis approach, like I said, he has, uh, several approaches there. They're supervised or semi-supervised. So we picked the supervised approach. Um, like I mentioned, the performance as far as different approaches are, are pretty similar to each other. Um, and, uh, the we picked this one because we actually had access to the code um, and and we did talk to you know we also contacted hello about this and yeah that's that's the code that was available for us to use it's the one for the supervised approach and so we ran it on on both of the data sets and uh so here uh you know i'm going into the tables of our results so the first is for the person um entity type and uh, so what I have in the table is the F1 score followed by precision and, and recall in the parentheses. So uh, to point out a couple of things, so majority rule does um, quite poorly and actually it's on par uh, for this entity type, it's on par with snorkel. So we did not get good performance out of snorkel on, on, on this data. Uh, then the, the weak learners or the different uh, named entity uh, recognition models um, have, you know, their performance uh, vary greatly. Um, Erbert is, like I mentioned before, a pretty powerful model. So that one um, does the first best from the weak learners. And uh, I guess the 
the last thing I want to point out is, is that our approach, we call it honor, um, so for Arabic on identity recognition on um, dash HMM, and it outperforms the um, Helva's approach um, and all the weak learners um, on, on both the data sets here. So on um, the next one is the performance on the location entity type. Um, similar story for uh, majority rule and snorkel, even though they, they both do better on, on this particular entity type. And uh, we outperform health's approach on the calc data set, but not on Darvish. And lastly, the organization um, entity type, that, one's, uh, that one tends to be the hardest. Those are recognized between these three types. And there we, we outperform health on the cult data set, but not also not in Darvish. So those are our results. And so for conclusion and future work on, I want to point out that uh, our um, approach strongly outperforms uh, both baselines and snorkel is actually quite commonly used for name entity recognition and the yeah, it did not perform well for our task. So we uh, significantly outperformed on um, a popular approach. Um, we also significantly outperform health on the calc on uh, uh, 2018 data set for all entity types, and we also perform help on the person type and Darvish data set. Um, so we achieve using these uh, hidden Markov models, we achieve uh, state of the art uh, accuracy for name entity recognition in Arabic for out of domain predictions. Um, and we don't require any labeled data, so that that's um, you know, really nice thing about this weak learning approach. Uh, we also don't need to train on any deep learning models. Um, it's, we could, it doesn't tend to improve the performance very much. So we just take the labels that, the, that we get uh, from this aggregation uh, algorithm that uses the hidden Markov models. And for future work, uh, so the you know the large language models are kind of like all the rage now, and so uh, we want to to look at that Arabic and multilingual large language models and uh, utilize them as potentially very powerful labeling functions to feed into um, our pipeline. Um, we also uh, so for the gazetteers. So the, the problem in Arabic, you have an awful lot of words that you know are both names and. Um, and just common words, there's a big overlap and the names are not capitalized. So our gazetteers, um, you know, we could get a, a better um, value out of a gazetteers if you if we uh, basically eliminated some of these issues. So we want to explore those and maybe train some model to improve the gazetteer annotations. And of course, um, including uh, more gazetteers with better coverage and including more uh, weak learners would be helpful as well. So um, that's that's all I have. Um, so thank you. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>